coming to no what wait wait how does english work the day is almost over that works right yeah the day is almost over what we're going to have now is four lightning talks apparently after i bothered you again two more people signed up which is better than zero absolutely but tomorrow i hope the board is filled with lightning talk submissions all right and i'm going to explain exactly how this works now so that tomorrow you're not afraid of signing up so lightning talk is a very short talk on a topic any topic it can be about python it doesn't have to be about python it's typically about something that you are passionate about and those tend to be the best lightning talks out there i've watched a lot of good lightning talks and the best ones were not about python last year at pycon portugal we had a talk about a small robot that just walked around for example that was very interesting that's suitable so i said it's a very short lightning talk typically you have a five minute five minute limit it tends to be strictly enforced it depends on the number of people lined up but it's five minutes maximum it doesn't have to be five minutes it's up to five minutes and when the time is over the person keeping track of time which today will be me starts clapping you join me in clapping and we clap the speaker off stage if they're still talking which is actually pretty fun all right so those are the ground rules does it make sense excellent so now why sure so now my time is over let's um, welcome martin on stage Hey, look at that, straight away. Oh, come on. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, my name's Martin and I am a Swifty. For at least 15 years, probably getting on for 20, uh, I, have been a I have been a fan of Taylor Swift's music, um, and I am a particular fan of her lyrical work, right? Uh, I am a massive fan of music. I'm sorry, Nick. I like music with words in it. Uh, <laughs> um, so, however, there are a lot of forums in the world uh, where people discuss Taylor Swift's lyrics. I know, I've looked. If, however, you are a software developer and a sort of wannabe data scientist, you create yourself a Swifty lyric bot uh, that you can use to ask it and to determine and to discuss themes, meanings, find, uh, find particular songs that mean particular things. Um, this is powered by GPT-4, and if you were listening to Nick's presentation earlier, you will know that GPT and all of the other large language models make stuff up. And the best way to stop them making stuff up is by giving them really good context, really good data. So um, this is the lyrics to Taylor Swift songs. There are 571 in the data set that I created. So if you are a... Uh, software developer Swifty like me, you take all of these lyrics, all 571 of them, you push them through a Python process, use OpenAI to extract entities and relationships, and what I mean by entities, outcomes, emotions, uh, people, places, things like that, and then you find relationships between those entities. Uh, so that on the right uh, represents a entity relationship or a graph of the story of the song love story romeo proposes to juliet juliet's role is <laughs> anyway you get the idea right. um juliet forbidden love with romeo you kind of get the idea all right and this is what that graph looks like um, and you can use this graph so this is a, a graph of this is only the first 100 nodes within a graph that contains 50,000 nodes uh, and a similar number of relationships. This is to the extent to which I went to understand the lyrics in Taylor Swift songs. Uh, and we can use this graph to find interesting things, such as, um, let's have a look at this one. 
Uh, this is the entities and relationships that you saw yeah, within that particular song uh, transferred into something that an LLM would understand. This is real factual information that I have extracted from that song. Uh, person Romeo proposed to person Juliet. Person Romeo talked to person Juliet. Person Romeo is in a relationship with a person who he calls a princess. We get the idea. And by using this information, and with that chatbot, I can create uh, something that has more meaning yeah, and is based in factual words. Right? Somebody said to me, uh, like, this is just unstructured data. And I'm like, oh, no. Well, wouldn't it be better if it was like documentation or something? Like, no, because that's really boring. What's not boring is like creating a really obscure technology solution for a problem that doesn't really exist. <laughs> and I would encourage you all to do that. Uh, and if you want to find it, there you go. That's where it is. And if you want to learn a little bit more about how I do that, there is a, talk, there is a workshop tomorrow. Thank you all. All right, for our next speaker, I'm going to invite myself onto the stage. So, thank you. Hey there. Are you ready? Yes, I am. I will. Now, will I be lying? We don't know. So the timer is on. Now let me ignore it. <laughs> All right, so many microphones, I'm so confused. So this is a function I want to refactor with you. And the name should be pretty self-explanatory, but the way, or what this function does is, it accepts what I call an expression, which is, which is just a string that will be uh, composed of parentheses, and I'm checking if the parentheses are well balanced. If whenever I open a parenthesis, I close it, and if I don't try to close parentheses that were not opened, and that I don't um, what open parentheses that I don't close. So that's more or less the idea, and I have a couple of examples down here. Now, can I get them? Yes, I can. All right, so this is more or less what the function does, right? And I wrote this code, and I thought to myself, well, good for you, Rodrigo, but why are you doing maths with booleans and why are you using accumulate? Why does this look so complicated? You can just make this much simpler. And so what we can do is we can actually unravel this into simpler code, which might be easier to understand, you know, that doesn't use features that are really not needed here. So what I can do is I can go over each character in the expression and I'll give you a hint for some reason the setup here is very tilted, so live coding is extra difficult here because my hands are like this. But I'll go over the characters and I'll check if the character is an opening parenthesis. And if it is, then the depth of the nesting increases by one, right? That's the point. If the character is a closing parenthesis, can I do it? S barely, whoops keyboard shortcuts I didn't know existed, then the depth decreases by one. Let's make this an elif. Now, if the depth is negative, we have an issue, right? The depth should never be negative, so in this case, the nesting is not valid. And by the time I'm done, I should check if the nesting is zero. Does this look more or less equivalent? No. Okay, well, you can believe me. It looks more or less equivalent, but then I get the same problem. Why am I, I look at this code and I think, why am I using so many complicated features? Why, 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 uh, augmented assignment? Why am I doing this? Why don't I just use, I don't know, Dunder methods, right? I, it's, I don't need assignments. That's ridiculous. This should work just fine. And same thing, not, not an equals equals. I can just do depth dot sub one. Same thing. I don't need augmented assignment. That's an unnecessary feature. I don't even need. I think just best if I use the type directly. 
I swear to God it's going to look much better. So this is not strictly equivalent, but in this context it is. So that's going to be good enough for our purposes. And then, why do I stop here? Why do I need comparison operators? Why don't I just use the dunder method that we all know and love? That's definitely the same thing. This is, and this is getting so much better because now everyone understands it. Because I don't, I don't need to use features that people don't know. I'm just using the, the really, the core, the core of Python. That's what I'm using here. For example, I can just compare C and this. I don't need the equal, the the equality comparison and the same thing here. I can just do string dot under under equals C, and then the closing parentheses. This is. Same thing, right? Isn't it looking much better? <laughs> I don't know why they're laughing. And now what I can do is, now we're going into some weird territory because it's, it's not clear whether or not I'm really removing something that I should, because up until now I clearly was. But I don't really need the ifs here. I can just operate directly on the value. So what I'll do is, you see the one over here? I'll just copy and paste because I don't feel like typing. So I'll take this and I'll move it here. And I'll get rid of that and I'll unindent. Now this is equivalent because I'm only adding when there's a match. And I can do the same thing down here. I can take, where is it? I can take this and I can move it here instead of the one. And I can delete that, unindent, and get rid of this line. And now I have a an issue with nesting of parentheses on my own function, which is hilarious. Right? It's much better. And now my time is almost over. Oh no. But we're also almost done, because for loops, they're not really needed. You don't need a for loop. You can just use a while loop, because it's the same thing. So what you do is, you create an iterator here. Really, just a for loop is just synthetic sugar for this. And then you try to get the next value out of your iterator. And people keep laughing. I don't understand why. Maybe this is why I was fired. Um, and then if you get a stop iteration, then you break. Actually, uh, yeah, you just break. And otherwise, you just keep going. Now, booleans are also a bit overkill. So let me just do this. And I forgot to change the equals equals here, but I think you get the idea. So I think this is much better. Um, if you agree, you can clap. If you don't agree, you can also clap. And tomorrow I'll tell you why I was fired in my talk. Thank you. Up next we have Michele. Uh, Michele. Michele. I knew I was going to butcher that. So let's <laughs> give Michele a warm round of applause. It. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. Okay, so um, am I a very experienced uh, Python developer? No. So I have been a, a Scala developer for seven years. Uh, this is not prepared. I prepared it uh, five minutes ago uh, when uh, uh, there weren't any, uh, enough people to do uh, flash talks. So this is going to be about my experience uh, uh, passing from Scala to Python and some personal opinions about both languages. So um, for those who don't know, so Scala is a, a functional programming language, uh, well, half functional, half object oriented, built on top of the JVM. And it's great at some things and not great at some other things. And uh, so in my talk today, I'm going to tell you about things that I like about Scala and things about that I like about Python in my very short experience. And then you can make uh, of it w whatever you, you, you want. Cool. So, uh -huh. so things that I like about Scala. So Scala is great for some stuff, but it's not great at everything. So I'll tell you what I like about it. So it has a very, very solid um, 
type system, so solid, I would almost say it's draconian. And it's great for some stuff, but it's kind of a pain for other stuff. So, but, but, but you know, nothing is perfect. So something that I really like about Scala is that it encourages you, doesn't force you, but it encourages you to use uh, immutability, which uh, in some cases can be a very, very good thing. Think of uh, parallel programming or uh, asynchronous programming can be very, very nice to have stuff that doesn't change, mutable stuff. Um, re uh, referential transparency is a concept uh, in uh, uh, Scala and in general functional uh, programming languages that is uh, uh, really, really good. Uh, and th there are some nice patterns uh, that uh, we use in, uh, in Scala, um, some patterns that uh, are not used at as often uh, in other languages, think of, uh, well, uh, if you think about like the ACA uh, framework, uh, the actor system is, is quite quite nice, or like uh, newer versions of, uh, of Scala newer fr frameworks uh, have uh, uh, this, uh, this idea of functional effects, uh, and it, it's all very powerful. But le let's talk about like the really important stuff. So like functional programming can be really, really good fun. So um, do I encourage you to use Scala? Well, I mean, why not? I mean, if you have a moment and, uh, you know, that, that's a good idea. Uh, if, if I can suggest that there is a great book uh, in Scala, so if you want to learn Scala the hard way, but uh, the very satisfactory way, is uh, to read the functional programming in Scala by uh, Paul Cusano. It's a fantastic book and uh, I recommend it. It's a bit like playing Dark Soul. When, when you understand how to you know, do something uh, uh, with this book, it feels like uh, beating a boss in Dark Souls. Okay, great. So next uh, uh, thing, uh, I'm going to show you what I really like in Python, in my very short experience uh, with it. So, uh, and this is something that I saw also in uh, this conference and I really liked. And there is a, a focus on simplicity that you don't find in other languages. So in other languages, and I, I, I think that Scala is a bit, uh, you know, not great for that. There is a focus on complexity and uh, mathematical complexity, and that's great, and there is a time and space for that. But in Python, I, I really like the, the focus of how can we make onboarding of other people like easier, and I think it's a, it's a great thing that I, I really enjoy about the, the community. And the community seems to me very large compared to smaller languages like, like Scala, for example. Uh, and well, that, that's my experience, but again, uh, probably there, there are many factors that uh, contribute to that. But uh, the pipelines, because, uh, uh, you know, you don't have to compile the code and, uh, you know, you know the, 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 there are ways that you can make, uh, you know, the pipelines, uh, CICD pipelines uh, faster in, uh, in Python, but that, that's open to debate. I mean, uh, it could be just my, my experience. Uh, and I'm noticing that, uh, you know, uh, programming languages in general, this is not just Python, but... Uh, they, they are tending to become kind of all the same. So many of the features that uh, used to be exclusive to one language. I'm thinking of, uh, uh, so I, I didn't know that uh, Python, now, uh, Python now has uh, pattern matching and oh, that, that, that's quite nice. So now pattern, uh, it has pattern matching and uh, before you could find that uh, in languages like Haskell or Scala, but it, it's very nice to see that, uh, you know, various features are uh, find their, finding their way there. and. Something that I really like about Python, for example, is that uh, dealing with JSON, for example, is so much simpler than uh, Scala, for example. You, parsing JSON is great. Uh, and I really like these comprehensions. So that, that's me. So if you want to have a chat, please uh, come approach me. We can have a coffee together. And if you have any good book recommendations, uh, please uh, let me know. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. book recommendation for people moving into Python is the Quick Python book by Naomi Cedar. Um, it's written precisely for that. You already know programming, now you want to know Python. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. I just want to go back to this talk. Scala, things I like, solid type system, it's draconian, I don't like it that much. Okay. And for the last lightning talk of the day, let's welcome Maxim on the stage.
It works. Hello? Okay. Um, I know to switch in between languages is uh, complicated also if you speak about Scala and Python and also if you speak about really languages. And my uh, talk is about, about languages and what we should not translate. Um, and uh, before I start, special thanks for my family. <laughs> For my wife, Elena, for my children, Mark and Maya, and for my animals, Marcel and Kisa, and special thanks for my daughter, Maya. He created the illustration for all my presentation in this year, and uh, <laughs> Mark also helped. And who I am, um, my name is Maxim Danilov. I work many years with uh, software development, and since 2010, I work with uh, to organize translations for web resources. I start to work with PHP, and right now I work with um, Python and uh, Django. Uh, and this is a link to all my talks in this year. And what is uh, software translation pyramid? Uh, we uh, have uh, um, collected. Uh, uh, collected instructions to uh, localize our uh, software. Uh, we have also the specification how we can internation, internationalize <laughs> sorry, our uh, software. And uh, we have also the bunch of uh, uh, tasks uh, if we want to globalize our um, our application. Uh, uh, if you want uh, to know localization, how I pass my application to um, some country, internationalization internationalization, how I pass my application to language and globalization, how I uh, pass my uh, application globally to go to market on this country. And of course, we uh, always speak about translations and sometimes uh, created solution is genius. Thank you, IKEA. <laughs> Uh, it's genius, it's clever, and I know this is the really, really genius uh, idea to create those uh, instructions. But uh, sometimes uh, something goes wrong and something is too long. For example, Batman. Uh, uh, and it's really too long, probably you can see it uh, on, in different applications. Uh, for example, something like this, and I completely don't understand uh, what is uh, on the first line because this is a big sentence. And something, uh, sometimes something it's too short or uh, don't have enough place uh, to write something, uh, something like this. And uh, sometimes we are simply not able to uh, write something because it's not accepted. <laughs> but we can translate it, we can skip it. But one thing you should never translate. And what is it? <laughs> what is exactly you should never translate? This is example from a uh, website from uh, PyCon uh, Taiwan. Uh, there I also uh, should to made a talk. And this is languages. Please don't translate the name of languages on websites. It should be always written in language in which this language, uh, uh, in language of country, there this language is applied. Thank you, and see you on the, my workshop about translations. Uh, on uh, Saturday, uh, I show you how to translate uh, how to create a multi-language application from scratch with Python and Django in two hours. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Maxim. Maxim, thank you, folks. This was it for today. I hope to see you back here tomorrow at 9 a.m. Cheers. <laughs>